So this quotation is from Kathy DeBoer. She's actually the executive director of the American Volleyball Coaches Association. And she's written a great book. I guess I got like two more quotations about this. So you can see I'm a big fan of it. Her book is called Gender and Competition, How uh, Men and Women View Work and Play Differently. The excellent, excellent book. Like anybody who works with girls or women should read this book. It's amazing. So I, I really like this quotation of her saying that in the long run, the value of sports has little to do with the sport. It's really teaching females to appreciate battle and for males to value bonding. At its best, sport teaches us how to be whole people and thereby prepares us for a more successful life. Now obviously I like that you guys like that you're coaches and that's what we do. But I, I really believe that. I really believe we're making better people by coaching them. So we're going to talk about the socialization of females, how you can identify your ideal female athlete, creating great team chemistry, battling girl drama, creating a competitive culture. And then if y'all have any questions, we'll go from there. Okay, the socialization of females. So remember this picture. Like this is a really important picture for the whole presentation, okay? Because this is how we're socializing our females, right? do things together, we're all dressed the same, everybody's doing the same thing, there's no leaders, everybody's all on the same level, okay? So this is what we're, this is how we socialize our females. Okay, so Dr. Leonard Sachs is like an expert on single sex education. And I, I really like that idea because it's what I do. I, I coach a single sex, I don't co-ed, I don't teach a co-ed team. I just work with women. I really want to know why does he think that it's better to teach people separate. And in an article that he wrote called uh, Why Gender Matters, he says, so there's no differences in what girls and boys can learn. And before I keep going, this comes from everybody's heard that girls don't do well in math, or they don't like science and all this. And he's saying that's not true at all. Like, we're putting all this stuff on girls that's just not true. But there's nothing different in the way that girls and boys learn. But there are big differences in the way we teach them. And that's where a lot of his philosophy jumps off from. And so he talks about the two camps when it comes to gender socialization. It's nature, you know, we were born this way, or nurture, we're all born kind of the same, but then the adults in a child's life put this kind of societal pressure on them. And really the truth is somewhere in the middle. And so the nature theory, and this is, these are things that are kind of inherent, what they'll say inherent to girls. They want to please adults, they fear risk, they're more verbal, more social. I'm sure if you think about your team, they're thinking, yeah, that sounds about right. And what and they want to make connections. They want to make connections with each other, they want to make connections with the coach. And girls like to play cooperative games. It's just like their picture. And so we're already we're in trouble, right? When we're trying to ask them to do competitive things. And but the nurture theory says that just human people are born with a set of beliefs about it. You know, if you gave a little boy a Barbie doll, he'd be just as fine to play with it as he would with a toy gun, and vice versa with the girl. But when they do all the studies and research and all this stuff, that really turns out not to be true. You know, you can put two little boys and two little girls in a room with a whole bunch of toys, and a gender-specific toys on both sides, and the boys will gravitate to the more male toys, and the girls will gravitate to Okay, so then they take it another step further. They say, okay, well, we'll put girls in a room and we'll just put stereotypically male toys in And what they do is they feminize the toy, right? So the gun be becomes part of the tea party that she's having. And the same, you know, the opposite is true with the men or with the boys, is the Barbie doll turns into a gun, right? They're, it's just sometimes they're just quite different. Okay, so there are certain things, obviously, that we do in terms of nurture. Um, pink, there's nothing that says that girls wear pink. There's nothing that says that girls have long hair. There's, there's things, obviously, that we do to increase those things, but there are certain things that are just inherent to your female athletes. Okay, so this is my Kathy DeBoer, and I remember I told you I really like this book, Gender and Competition. It's excellent. You should go get it. Okay, so it says, until recently, it wasn't politically correct. You couldn't even think of women as different. Like, if you said that a woman was different, if, if, if it's, everything's going to be equal and fair, then she just can't be different. So now we can say that it's okay that a woman's different. You're not saying that 
that's a bad thing. And I think that, that shows that we've come a long way. Okay, so why is this important? Well, it's important for me so that you don't think that I'm just coming up with this stuff off the top of my head. Like there's people who have serious conversations about this in the academic world. And then as coaches, we have to know what we're working with when our athletes walk in the gym. You know, they're, they're coming in with a whole lot of stuff and we gotta make sure that we understand how to work with them and the different like, societal pressures, even at young ages that are on them, when we're asking them to be competitive when they're, that nurture says, let's be cooperative. Okay, so, like I said, if you can agree that women are different and there's nothing wrong with it, not better, not worse, just different. Okay, so if we can agree that they're different, then we can agree that motivating them is a little bit different as well. Okay, so our ideal female athlete. Okay, so this is a quotation from Emily Wiley, and I love this quotation because I thought I was the only one out there who thought like this. She's a charter school teacher at an all-girls school, and she says it's her subversive mission to create all these strong girls who then go out to the world and be astonished when people try and oppress them. And I thought I was the only one who felt like that. You know, I want my team to go out and take over the world, like seriously, you guys. I mean, I'm saying it's totally serious, like I want them. I had a girl in my office the other day, I'm like, you're going to be president. You're just amazing. And that's what I want. Like, I feel like we have that power to, to give to these young people. So Franklin Covey says that begin with the end in mind. So when you think about your coaching and the athletes that you're working with, I mean, obviously you want to teach them skill work. You want to win your games and all that. But it's got to be something bigger than that. You can't do coaching just give you some coaching. And you got to do something bigger with it. So what's that big thing that you want to do? And it really should, it'll, it'll influence everything you do, like how you deal with parents, how you deal with your athletes, and it should influence how your, uh, how your team interacts with one another. Okay, so here are my eight characteristics of an ideal female athlete, which not coincidentally are just like eight characteristics of an amazing person who I think can really do some wonderful things. And there's a book out, I wrote this, this is a chapter, it's from a chapter that I wrote in a book. It's called, like it says, there, They're Not Boys Safely Training the Adolescent Female Athlete. And that book is more about like, actual training, preventing injuries and all that kind of stuff. But he wanted to talk about the mental aspect of coaches working with females. So my uh, chapter in it was called A Navigational Map for Coaching Female Athletes. And these are my eight things, like confidence. So like the real stuff, not the confidence, like I did something really well, so I feel good about myself, but then I do something wrong and I feel like I'm the worst player ever. But like the real stuff that even when things are up and down, they still feel good about themselves. So we can get that to our athletes. That's a great thing. It's success. We want our athletes to experience success. And there's, I think there's ways we can do that every day in practice. And uh, ultimately we want that big success, you know, winning big games. Self-motivated. Wanting to do stuff, not because their parents told them they have to go to practice. But they really want to go to practice. They really want to get in there and work. Okay, hard working. And that's a tough one. I think it's tough for coaches because we can't, sometimes our, some one athlete is just better than another. And it looks like she's working hard, but really she's just a better athlete than everybody else. And so that hard working thing, that's got to come in. That's got to come from within. We can't give it to them. Leadership is always a great thing. And not just, I heard this at my convention, because I'm a, I'm a professional development work. I go to everything that my sport puts on. And I heard a great uh, conversation at my convention, and it said, there's no such thing as leaving by example. Because like, when people talk about leaving by example, they say, you're being on time, you're working hard. And he's like, isn't that what everyone's supposed to do? And there's no leading by example. That's like the base requirement for coming to practice, is to work hard, be on time, and get you know, maximum effort. Okay, so leadership's got to be beyond just that kind of thing. Teaminess. And that's a word I create. I feel like I should create more because it's really good. <laughs> it's, being, it's the team's first. Like, I'm going to do whatever I need to do for the team. You know, you tell, her, you tell one of the girls on your team, we need you to play a position you've not played before because somebody got it. Sure, coach. We got to sit you down because you're not playing well. That's all right, coach. Like, that kind of player. The person who puts everybody first, the team's interests first. And clearly skill is a good thing to have. I'm not right to yell at me, right? They've got to be good at what they do. And it's a hunger. I don't know if you guys have had athletes who are skilled, but not like hungry to get better. So then they're, they're still good. 
because they're good, but they're never going to be really good because they don't have that hunger to get better. So if you can get all that in one person, that's pretty awesome. And I think we can help our athletes at least introduce them to these ideas. Okay, so creating great team chemistry. Okay, so this is our Dr. Leonard Sachs again, and this is a different article he wrote called uh, Differences, uh, Gender Differences in Learning. It says, researchers have consistently found that girls are more concerned than boys with pleasing adults. Okay, so that's us. So I, sometimes I run into coaches and they say, you know, I just coach. I don't have to worry about all this team dinners and people getting along and having fun stuff. But this tells us that you do, because you're a significant part of this young woman's life. Okay, so as we talk about team chemistry, we're going to talk about coaching philosophy, uh, team building ideas, and personality assessments. Okay, so developing a coaching philosophy. So like I said, I go to all these conventions and seminars and things, and I've gone to a lot of things where you sit down for an hour and you write down everything that's important to you, and come up with this coaching philosophy, three paragraphs long, that sounds really amazing, but you don't remember it later. Like you read it a year later, you say, oh, it's good, but you still don't know it. And so that's what um, a consultant wrote in an article on Harvard Business Review's blog. I highly recommend this one. It's, I think there's a real strong connection between the business world and the athletic world, so I do. I read a lot of business magazines and business blogs and things like that. So anyway, so I go to this blog, and, he's, and this guy, he's a consultant, so he goes to this corporation, and he talks to this regular employees, and he says, okay, what's the company's mission statement? He's like, the president of the company says, this is hugely important. We really believe in our mission statement. So he asks the employees, what's the mission statement? They have no idea. So he moves up to like middle management. Okay, your president says the mission statement is super important to him. It's like a, the background, the backbone for what your guys are doing. What's the mission statement? Moves up to upper management. The president says, super important. Everybody needs to know what the mission statement is. They don't know, like him and mom are trying to make it, but they don't know what it is. So what he says is they're too long. You know, so if you got a coaching philosophy that you can't say quickly that encompasses everything, then it's not really a good philosophy because if it's just for you, you know, your athletes need to know it, your parents need to know it, like everybody needs to know what this coaching philosophy is. Okay, so what he challenged them to do was creating a mission statement in eight words or less. I thought that was amazing, that was great. So I immediately started writing it down. I put this up on my blog, it must have been a year ago now. And I just started just brainstorming different things. I think it's an amazing exercise. Everybody should try and do it. Try and sum up everything you believe in eight words or less. It's, it's, it's interesting. Okay, so the first one is actually my real one. When I have recruits coming to the office or I'm talking to my team, that's where I say, like, we're gonna work hard, but we're gonna have that's, that's our thing. Okay, so that, but the, the other four ones that I would just kind of brainstorm it through. So like prepare players to achieve. So that one's pretty good, but I feel like there should be more at the end. So that, um, that one's okay. Lead them, teach them, love them. Now those are true, but it doesn't sound like we're going to win any games. Is the only problem with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Preparing athletes for success. That one's not bad. I still feel like there should be some more after it, though. And creating leaders one athlete at a time. So I feel like that one, like the first one and the last one, those are my favorites. But like I said, it's a great exercise to try to think about the things you really believe in and just try and do it in eight words or less. And just keep going. Keep going, stop at one. Just keep going. Like these are, believe it or not, the best that I came up with. I had some more that I didn't put up there. But it's really, it becomes a guiding post for everything that you do. Like, if, if we want to work hard and have fun, then I got to make sure when I create a practice plan that that's what's in there. And when I'm recruiting, I gotta make sure that I'm telling people that when I'm talking to parents and trying to sell them on being in school. Like everything is about that coaching philosophy. So I, I'd highly encourage folks to do that. Okay, so team building stuff. And I don't know if you guys have read any of Jeff Jansen stuff, but he's really good. He's got a website out there. I think it's just jeffjansen.com. It's really good. He's got a lot of free information on his website, but he's also got this book out there. It's Championship Team Building. Very, very, very good. It talks about the different stages, that, like the normal stages that the team will go through. And also at the end of each chapter, they have different team building exercises. And